Hey there, in this video we're going to continue finding antiderivatives of functions. And this is part two of this um, video series. So in this example we're going to start with, given the second derivative, find the original function. So that means when I take the antiderivative of this, so let me rewrite it so I can use the general power rule. And just as a reminder, the general power rule for antiderivatives is we do the opposite of when we take just a derivative, which means that instead of bringing the power down, we in decreasing the power by one, we add one to the power, so add one to the power, and then divide by the new power. So what that means is that then if your derivative is x to the n, then the original function is you add 1 to the exponent, so it would be x to the n plus 1, and you divide by n plus 1, and then plus a constant. So here, since I have the second derivative, when I take the antiderivative of this, I'm going to get the first derivative. So the first derivative will be, take the antiderivative of this, so add 1 to the exponent, so it will be x to the minus 2 plus 1, and you divide by the new exponent, minus 2 plus 1 is negative 1, and then plus a constant. So my derivative, f prime of x, then is x to the negative 1, divided by negative 1, that just makes it negative, plus c. And now here, notice that to find f again, or to find f, we have to take the antiderivative again, but notice that if I continue with the general power rule, when I add 1, negative 1 plus 1 is 0, and I can't divide by 0, so that's not right. And that's because here, what's really going on is x to the minus 1 is 1 over x. And what is the antiderivative of 1 over x? This has a specific, right, which function did we take the derivative of to get 1 over x? This has a very specific antiderivative and it's the natural log. So this is negative natural log of absolute value of x and plus cx because this is now a constant in the first derivative. So when I take the antiderivative, I have to attach an x. And again, check if you can check your work by taking the derivative and get all the way back to the original then we're good, right? So you can check, take the derivative. f prime of x will be negative 1 over x plus c, and then f double prime of x will be, t this is negative x to the minus 1, so this will be negative times a negative, so positive x to the minus 2, and that the derivative of this will be 0. So you just get 1 over x squared, which is what we started with. So the one thing to be really mindful of is when you have x to the minus 1, if you try to do the general power rule, it's not going to work. So you have to write it as 1 over x. And then you're able to recognize, oh, 1 over x, that's the, the derivative of natural log of x. And so when you go backwards, the antiderivative, natural log of absolute value of x, because the domain of natural log, you can only have positive numbers in there. So let's try another example. So let's try this one, say find f, the original function f, if the second derivative is given. And we have some initial conditions here. So n, the first derivative evaluated at 0 is 2, and f of 1 is equal to 2. Okay, so now let's try this. So I'm given again the second derivative, and I'm going to rewrite that so I can use the general power rule. So that's x to the 1 third minus cosine of x. So when I take the antiderivative, the antiderivative of the second derivative is the first derivative, so f prime of x, and this, so antiderivative, so we add 1 to the exponent, so it's x to the 1 third plus 1, and then we divide by that new exponent. 1 third plus 1 is 4 thirds, I think, but I'll just, just to be con consistent here. And what's the antiderivative of cosine x? what when you take the derivative of what you get cosine x and that will just be sine so we're still minus sine x right and remember take the derivative the derivative of sine is cosine so the sine doesn't change plus a constant so let's simplify it so if prime of x is x to the 
three thirds plus one third is in fact four thirds. Divided by four thirds is the same thing as multiplying by three fourths minus sine x plus the constant. So this is where we can use our first initial condition. Notice that we are given that f prime of zero is two. So let's use that f prime of zero equals two. So what does that mean? So this means when x is zero, right, the thing inside is dx, when x is zero, the derivative is two. So we can put that in here. So f prime of zero will be two, and then equals, and we can put in the rest. Three fourths times x, x is zero, to the four thirds, so zero, minus sine of zero, which is 0 plus c. So 0, 20 power is 0, and sine of 0, we know that that's 0, so you just have 2 equals 0 minus 0 plus c, so that tells us that c is equal to 2. So we can now write our first derivative, so f prime of x is 3 fourths x to the 4 thirds minus sine x plus c, but we just solved for c, so plus 2. So now this is our very specific derivative containing that, that characteristic, this point, f prime of 0 is 2. Now let's find f, so I'm going to take the antiderivative again, so f of x will be then 3 fourths times, and then add 1 to the exponent, so 4 thirds plus 1 divided by the new exponent, 4 thirds plus 1. Now the antiderivative of sine x. The antiderivative of sine x is negative cosine x, or since we already have the negative here, we can say what function gives us a derivative of negative sine x, and that will be cosine x, plus the antiderivative of 2, plus 2x, and then plus another constant. So I can just call it c, because I already know from there c is 2, but c is just standing in for a constant, right? I could call it d, you can call it c1, c2, c3, whatever you want to call it. So now let's simplify this. Um, so 4 thirds plus 1, so 1 is 3 thirds, so we get what? 7 thirds. So I'm going to have 3 fourths and then x to the 7 thirds. Dividing by 7 thirds is the same thing as multiplying by 3 sevenths. And then I have plus cosine x plus 2x plus c. And now we can use our other condition. The initial condition was that f of 1 is equal to 2, and so we can use this. So now we can use f of 1 equals 2, and what does that mean to say that f of 1 is equal to 2? This means that when x is equal to 1, the y values, right, f is 2. Was it the same? They were both 2, f prime of 0 is 2. Okay, just making sure I wasn't confusing it with the previous part. So my f of x, let me just rewrite it, simplify. So 3 times 3 is 9, 4 times 7 is 28, x to the 7 thirds plus cosine x plus 2x plus c. And now we can plug in our values. So f of 0 is 2, so this is going to be 2 equals to 9 over 28, 0 to the 7 thirds, oh not 0, x is 1, um, 1 to the 7 thirds um, plus cosine of 1 plus 2 times 1 plus c. So x is equal to 1, the y value is equal to 2. Right, so this is this will be f of 1 is 2. And then simplify it. So this was going to give us the other value. So I'm going to have 2 equals 9 over 28 plus cosine of 1 plus 2 plus c. And solve for c. When you subtract this 2, you're, well, those are going to cancel actually. And we're trying to solve for c. So c is going to be b, so bring this over to the other side. So negative 9 over 28 minus cosine of 1 is equal to c. You don't have to change cosine of 1 
to a decimal, you can just leave it like that. So what is our final function? Right, so it will be this f of x, but instead of plus c, we're going to say plus this quantity. So our function is 928x to the 7 thirds. So our final answer is f of x equals 928x to the 7 thirds plus cosine of x plus 2x and then plus c but we just found c to be this so plus a negative so minus 9 over 28 minus cosine of 1 so that's how the initial conditions work they help you find the very the specific uh, function once you have a function value given right like here f of 1 equals 2 that's a, now a very specific function um, another way you can think of it is when you have the plus c that's like a set of solutions so that the functions the set of solutions look like this but once you have a specific one then you have, you're finding a very specific function that goes through that point all right let's try a position function example so we have this example a rocket rocket takes off from the ground with a constant acceleration of 20 meters per second square how fast and how high is the rocket after one minute so now back when earlier in calc one we had remember the position functions so when you had due to acceleration we had s of t the position is what if we had minus 16 t squared plus v naught t plus s naught where v naught is the initial velocity and s naught is the initial height or initial position so um, notice that so side note here or tangent not not calculus tangent but just I'm going off on a tangent <laughs> um, so if this is the position function notice that when we take the derivative we get the velocity function so we get minus 32t plus v naught which gives us the initial velocity right so when t is zero you get the initial velocity so this is we learned to call this v of t minus 32t plus v naught and then when you the acceleration function is the second derivative of the position function right is is as double prime of t which will be minus 32 which is acceleration due to gravity on earth so going backwards now that we're doing antiderivatives if i'm given the acceleration can i get to the position yes if i'm given acceleration i can take antiderivatives to get back to the position which is what's happening here we're given a constant acceleration of 20 meters per second square so this is our acceleration so it's 20 meters per second square so how do i get to the how fast and how high so i need velocity and i need position so how fast is telling me to find velocity how high is telling me to find position so i need to be able to get back to those but i know that the acceleration is the second derivative of the position function so when i when i get to that i just take the antiderivative so the velocity is the antiderivative of the acceleration and the position function is the antiderivative of velocity all right so i know my acceleration is 20 meters per second square so that means that my velocity is going to be the antiderivative of this so it's going to be 20 t plus a constant so let me call it c1 and then the position function is going to be the antiderivative of that so it's going to be 20 t squared over 2 plus c1 t plus c2 and so i can say the position function for this particular rocket is 10 t 
t squared plus c1t plus c2. And what am I giving any initial conditions? All I know is that a rocket takes off from the ground. So what do I know here? So ground, that is the initial position. So that means that at t equals 0, the position s is 0 also. So it's on the ground, right? If it said a rocket takes off from a platform that is 20 meters from the ground, then, then the initial position will be time is 0, but the position will be 20 meters. So here we are going from the ground, so which constant can I find? I can only find c2. Right, so since C2 is equal to 0 because it's from the ground. You can also plug in T equals 0 and you'll see that you'll be left with 0 equals C2. So I can say then S of T, the position function, is 10T squared plus C1T plus 0. Um, we don't have anything else to find C1. So if we were given something about the velocity, then I could find it. I need something else, right? I need to know about the, something about the velocity, about the first derivative, so that then I, I can find my initial velocity. But right now I don't have any of that. So all I can say is that the position function is gonna be 10t squared plus c1t. So when t equals one, because we wanna find it after, oh, after one minute. This is in meters per second square. So when t equals one minute, that means really that it is 60 seconds. So s of 60 will be 10 times 60 squared plus c1 times 60. So I will need to know the initial velocity so that I can get a numerical answer for this problem. And so good thing to keep in mind here is that your units, make sure that your units match, right? Here I'm using my acceleration is 20 meters per second squared, so my units should be in seconds, unless you wanna convert the 20 meters per second squared to 22 meters per minute squared, but I think it's easier to convert one minute to 60 seconds <laughs> than trying to convert the 20 meters per second squared to meters per minute squared. So just make sure that your units are matching up. All right, email me if you have any questions.